How many of you own your own business? Let me see. <clears throat> this message is for you. How many of you are in a supervisory role or a management role? Let me see your hands. This message is for you. Any parents? <laughs> this message is for you. Grandparents, <laughs> this message is for you. Here's one. How many of you are married? This message is for you. How many of you have children and teenagers? This message is for you. How many of you have parents still living? This message is for you. How many of you are breathing? This message is for you. Tonight, I just want to share some thoughts. What I believe is one of the most important life skills that we need to know about and learn about and practice. And that is simply how to resolve conflict to be able to move forward to restore a relationship. Would y'all be interested in learning that tonight? Good, uh, we got the right crowd. But here's the problem. We were never taught how to do that. Think about it. Our parents never sat us down and spent time with us showing us and modeling how to resolve conflict. Maybe it's because they were never shown. There was never a high school class that you could register for and take. There was no Resolve Conflict 101. For me in high school, me and a bunch of buddies, football buddies, we took home ec. We signed up for home ec. There were about 20 in the class and the 15 of us were from the football team. <laughs> After the year was out, guess who got the Betty Crocker Award? See, there was no resolved conflict class. So we never learned. We've never maybe have seen it modeled in our own family. What we did model was fight or flight, right? We, we've heard that from, from counselors and maybe even from preachers. That's how we handle conflict. It became our method, which honestly leads to a miserable life. I don't know about you, but I'm not a fan of conflict. Anybody in here a fan? But hopefully tonight, we can learn and let the Lord speak to us to see how we can handle conflict. I just learned this morning that I've got to preach next Wednesday. I'm the one who makes the schedule out on Wednesdays, and I didn't even realize I'd scheduled me back to back. And I thought, well, okay, i got to have a message for next Wednesday. What? And I thought, well, Lord, and all of a sudden the Lord said, well, why don't you do a two-part series? Well, that's a thought. And so I'll be here next Wednesday. Hey, if you want to show up, that's fine. But I'm just going to extend this teaching till next Wednesday as well. And I think it's going to be very fitting as we enter this Christmas holiday season. There's a, a great quote out there. It says, conflict is inevitable. Combat is optional. We do know that conflict is inevitable, right? It usually involves misunderstandings. It usually involves hurt feelings. It usually involves pain, arguments, disagreements, anger. How about this one? Drama. And maybe even some crossed boundaries. Maybe you've encountered it in the workplace. Anybody ever had a conflict at a workplace? Come on, let me see. 
Maybe in your marriage. Maybe in a relationship with a child, teenager. Maybe even with a parent. Did you know that in the workplace, just about every, most employees have to deal with conflict at least three hours a week? Get this, managers, supervisors, a lot of them will spend 42% of their week dealing with conflict. Makes you want to go be a supervisor real quick, doesn't it? <laughs> and in marriages, they say that um, right after, well, when the COVID broke out in 2020, they say that up to 75% of married couples began to experience stress, overwhelmness, even some physical things in their bodies to the point that it caused so much conflict, not only with their spouse, but with their children. So no matter if it's in the workplace or maybe even at home, conflict seems to be staying around for a little while. There's conflict in our world. I mean, how many wars are there right now going on? I don't have that number, but there's always conflict around. There are many ways to try to deal with conflict. Many self-help books. Maybe counselors can help you. Maybe we can handle it our own way because of what maybe we did not see in the home or maybe what we did see in the home. But tonight I want to share with you what I believe is the right way from God's Word. And it's one word. Everybody turn to your neighbor and say one word. The ultimate one word answer is right from the Sermon on the Mount. And it's found in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 9, and it's in your handout. It says this, Jesus says, Blessed are the peacemakers. For they're called the sons of God. Peacemakers. That is our one word answer to moving beyond the struggles of conflict. Amen? It's not avoidance. It's not fight or flight. But it is peacemaker. So tonight is part one. Next Wednesday will be part two of how to overcome the struggle that we have with conflict. Let me just share with you a couple things about peacemaking. If we don't pursue peacemaking, it, it blocks our relationship with God. Do, do you realize that? Oh, we say we love God, but then we're in so much turmoil with our spouse. How can we say we love Jesus and we shout hallelujah because the song is good or the preaching is good? But then we go back to the workplace and we're fussing with our coworker. If we're not seeking peacemaking, it's blocking our prayers. You know, in 1 Peter, I think it's chapter 3, that there's uh, husbands, I'm not picking on you, but hey, it's in the Bible. The Bible's picking on you, okay? It talks about husbands. Treat your wives right. And then a little bit further in the verse, I think it's uh, verse 7, it says, if you don't treat them right, your prayers will be hindered. If we're not seeking peacemaking, it, it takes away from our joy. You may have experienced conflict during the holidays with a family member. How'd that go for you? And you may have to be with them again in about four weeks for, th for uh, Christmas. So I'm here tonight to just say, I I'd just like to offer you some help. Can we do that? 
And James tells us how do we get to that point of peacemaking. And it's just one verse. And it's in your handout. It says this in James chapter 3 and verse 18. And those who are peacemakers will plant seeds of peace. And reap a harvest of righteousness. Plant seeds. Interesting, Blue, that you mentioned tomatoes. You know, it takes one seed for a tomato plant, right? One seed. Do you all agree? Any gardeners in here? No matter what you plant, it's, it's one seed. But all of a sudden, it starts to grow. Some of you, tomato grow, any tomato growers in here? Let me, let me see your hand. Anybody likes to grow tomatoes? How many tomatoes can you get off of one plant? Several. Eight, ten, twelve, I don't know how many. And guess what? In those tomatoes are more seeds. And we're going to reap a harvest if we pursue peace and plant some seeds. So tonight, this is what I want to do. We're only going to talk about the first three. I think I'm going to work on seven. Um, I think that's where the Lord is taking me. But tonight, we're just going to do three. But it's three seeds that we can plant to become peacemakers. Amen? So we can say tonight and settle the issue, in order to resolve conflict, we need to plant some seeds. Turn to your neighbor and say, it's time to plant. The goal for resolving conflict is peacemakers. Amen? Number one, the first seed we got to plant is we have to make the first move. That's your, next, that's your first blank. we got to make the first move when it comes to resolving conflict. In other words, we have to take the initiative. Be a peacemaker. It's more important than worship. What? Yes, let me show you. Let me prove it to you. Watch this. Matthew 5, it says this. So or if you're presenting a sacrifice at the altar at Family Life Church, and you suddenly remember you're raising your hands because the worship team is knocking it out of the park. And you are worshiping with your, with your heart. And you are singing hallelujah. And all of a sudden it says, and suddenly remember that someone has something against you. What does it say? It says, leave church at the altar and go. And go and go be reconciled to them. Amen. And it says, then come back to church. So what we have here, Jesus is saying, take care of it. It's more important than worship. Don't let it fester. How many of you have ever had a a fallout or some fellowship with your spouse on the way to church? Let me, let me see your hand. How'd that work out for you? <laughs> what this verse is saying is, Jesus would rather you drive up in the parking lot and handle it before you come in here. Amen? So what we have to do is just simply don't delay. Get after it. Take care of it. Because conflict never resolves itself accidentally. Someone has to take the first step into reconciliation. Oh, but Rob, I heard the old saying, time heals everything. That's baloney. If that's the case, and I've got a cut and it's bleeding and I need stitches, Oh, okay, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to go to the doctor and just sit in the waiting room and not see the doctor, but let, I'll just sit there for 12 hours from 8 to 8 and let time heal me. No, what do we do? We, we got to make an appointment. We got to see the doctor. He's got to sew it up. Amen. We, we can't go around. We can't try to avoid. We can't postpone. We have to make the first move. And what causes postponement? It's just simply fear. Maybe fear of the outcome if we take the first move. Fear of rejection. 
You know, fear is a grippling thing that can literally buckle us to our knees. First person that we see in the Bible is in Genesis 3. It's our friend Adam. He answered, he says, I heard you in the garden. He's talking to God. And I was afraid. Fear crippled Adam. It's here in fear of taking the first move that we, we start building walls. We detach. We try to distance. We think, oh, it, time's going to take care of it. But look, realistically, it's not going to happen. Amen? We become insecure with ourselves. We doubt that anything's going to happen if we take the first... Well, what if they don't? And well, well, let me just share with you and answer the question, how can we take the first move? Well, let me just let you in on a little secret. How can we have the courage to make the first move? It's the Holy Spirit. A wonderful story about conflict, and I'll read it very quickly. In the book of Acts, chapter 4, it says this, The priest and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. They were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. Here we go. We got conflict. It's starting. Do you see it? They seized Peter and John, more conflict. And because it was evening, they put them in jail until the next day. This screams conflict right here. But many who heard the message believed, and the number of men grew to about 5,000. The next day, the rulers, the elders, and teachers of the law met in Jerusalem. Aeneas, the high priest, was there, and so were Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and the other men of the high priest's family. They had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them. Another example of more conflict piled on Peter and John. And this is what they asked them. By what power, and who do you think you are, by what power or what name did you do this? Then Peter made the first move, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, very boldly, I may add, rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to an account today for an act of kindness shown to a cripple and are asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. conflict, Peter makes the first move because he was filled with the Holy Spirit. And I think this is a great segue into how can we have the courage? How can we... Because in us, we can't do it, right? It takes something a lot more than us to make the first move. Because realistically, who likes conflict? But with the power of the Holy Spirit, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is in us to help us make that first move. Amen? It's also found in Zechariah 4, 6. I love this. So he said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. Bububble, bububble, whatever that his name is. Not by power nor by might, but by my spirit, says the Lord. So, how can we make the first move? Tell me. Tell me here. Holy Spirit. Yielding ourself and saying, Holy Spirit, you're going to have to get inside of me. It is going to be by an unction of the Holy Spirit that I am going to be victorious to start planting a seed. And so, Holy Spirit, I'm ready to take the first move. Amen. Remember, the goal is to be a peacemaker. Seed number two. We have to ask God 
for wisdom. So number one, we got to make the first move. But then we get to how do we do it? Where do we do it? When do we do it? Well, let me just show you in Scripture, and I've got two versions that I think really explain. John chapter 1, it says, Any of you lacks wisdom, he should go on the Internet and hit the first three websites and then call your brother-in-law who thinks he knows everything and get some information from him. And if it's wrong, then you go back to the inner. Is that what it says? Ask who? Ask God. Who gives generously to all without finding fault. And it will be given to him. Look what it says, how it says it in the Message Bible. If you don't know what you're doing, if you don't know how to make the first move, ask the Father, pray to the Father. He loves to help. You'll get His help. And He's not going to hold it over your head. It won't come in a condescending way back to you because He loves us. So how do we get through and how do we make the first move? It's through the Holy Spirit. But then we got to ask God for wisdom. How many of you know that when you're dealing with conflict, you're dealing with people, right? The approach and timing is important. Would you all agree? Have you ever tried to resolve conflict and it wasn't driven by God? It was driven by you and it just it flopped. Maybe God is saying to us, hey, before you build your little plan, why don't you run it by me? (laughs) And here's the cool thing. God is so generous that He's not going to just let you figure this out on your own. He's going to give you the space and the time and the ability and even the words to say. And let me just say this. If you're in conflict, maybe you just need to call a time out and let the Lord begin speaking to you because sometimes we react we uh, we react too fast and it comes across cold and and heartless and it's not the right way. Have you ever done that? Come on, I got Here's the great news. God is a loving God. And he's not going to hold it over us if we're struggling. He sees, he already knows our struggle. He already has the plan. He's just waiting for someone to sort of make that first move and connect with him to learn what's the best method, even the best time of the day. Right? Your thought might be, well, let me do it in a crowd of people because I don't want that person to erupt like a vault. No, no, no. Maybe God wants you to go have lunch or maybe God wants you to do this. You know what I'm saying? Maybe go sit on the back porch where it's just you and that other person. But we have to ask God for wisdom. How many of you know that even our countenance and our speech and uh, our tone of voice can be vetri- very detrimental to the success of conflict, right? We want to say the right words at the right time, the right way. Amen? How many times have we said it the wrong way at the wrong time and it just did not go well? Remember, the goal is what? Peacemaking. The goal is what? Okay, let, let, me, let me get you to say that one more time. The goal is what now? It's peacemaking. That's what we're after. That's what Jesus told us to do. This is not Rob's theory. This is Jesus' instruction for us. Again, whether it's at home, whether it's with a child or a parent or a co, even a neighbor, a spouse, peacemaking is the ultimate goal. Number three, the third seed and the final seed is we have to begin with what's my fault. 
I heard a huh. <laughs> huh. It begins with what's my fault. You want to start with, okay, let's say you've done everything right, and, and now you are at the point that you're trying to resolve the conflict. The person is in front of you, <clears throat> and, and the floor is yours. Remember, you take the first move. You say the first words by not saying, it's your fault. No, you say, hey, I'm here tonight. I'm here today to let you know that, man, I am I messed up and I am wrong. And you begin owning your faults. Even if the other person did 99.9% .9 of the stuff, you know what I'm saying? You take ownership and then you admit. And, whoa, lost my place. Come on, come back. Help me. Thank you, Jesus. We want to do it that way instead of being accusatory or coming out the gates attacking the person let me just let you know that, that that's not going to go well. But if we come out the gates with saying, hey, my heart is open to not only hear what you have to say, but I want to let you know that, hey, I take full responsibility. In James chapter 4, it says this, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? Look how the message says it. Where do you think all these appalling wars and quarrels come from? Do you think they just happen? Think again. They come about because you want your own way and fight for it deep inside yourselves. I don't know if you realize this, but we're all self-centered, aren't we? But when it comes to resolving conflict, we have to just simply lay it down and say, Lord, do a work in me. Do a work in this conversation. Because, Lord, there is no good thing in me, but, Lord, with you in me, Lord, we're going to begin this conversation the way you want me to begin it. With the goal of peacemaking. Remember, that's our goal, is peacemaking. And I'm telling you, it will do something to the air in the room that maybe might surprise you. The prophet Isaiah portrayed the problem <clears throat> 25, over 2,500 years ago about <clears throat> the self centeredness. It says in Isaiah 53, all of us like sheep have strayed away. <clears throat> We have left God's paths to follow our own. See, maybe in the past, we followed our own path to resolving conflict. And I'm just going to let you know that it's never going to work out. But when we follow the tools and the resources and the words and the way to do it and the process, it's going to work out. See, if we don't, we stay in a state of immaturity. We don't grow. We don't mature. Because that's what the Bible tells us to do, right? Do you realize that your job is to mature in the Lord? To learn. Not just from what whoever's up here speaking your Bible reading time, what the Lord is speaking to you. And if we don't learn it God's way how to resolve conflict, we just simply stay in a state of immaturity. And immaturity says, the fault is yours. It's their problem. They need to make the first move. We put it on them. God says, no, no, no. The moment you put it on them, pride comes in. And it looks like you don't have the problem. Let me ask you this question. You've read the Bible, right? You, you've read parts of the Bible, at least a few chapters and whatnot. Have you ever run across a prideful Jesus? 
Have you ever run across a self-centered Jesus? Have you ever run across an immature Jesus? Let me tell you what pride leads to. Proverbs 13, and it's in your handout. Pride leads to arguments. If you don't lay down that thing called pride and immaturity, resolving the conflict is not going to end well for you and the other person. So number one, we got to take the first move, right? We got to ask God for wisdom. And then we just simply have to say, you know what? It is my fault. Let me begin the conversation. And I'm telling you, the results are going to be breathtaking. It's going to be amazing. And you're going to be able to sit down and say some things from your heart. They're going to do the other person well, and they're going to benefit from it. Amen. It means being transparent. Let me, let me, th those of you that are in a supervisory role, where are you? Or maybe you own your business, where we got a few of you. What if tomorrow you go to work and you get the guy or the person that you're having a struggle with and a conflict with and you say, hey, do you have a second? Hey, I just want to be transparent with you, man. I'm struggling. Not that you, you, you put away the tough guy act, but you, you literally say, hey, man, I just want to be honest and transparent with you. How about trying that? Do you think that might work? That they see that you're struggling. And you're not trying to put the Christianese words on them and the, 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 the boss words on them, right? All the terminology. And this admitting faults first can benefit your marriage as well. Amen? It got real quiet. You know, sometimes in a marriage, we're opposite, right? Some may like, they're morning people. Any morning people? Any night people? Yo, look at all these night people. I'm a morning person. Michelle will tell you, she's not. When I get up, I don't need coffee to wire me up. I'm up. I'm ready. It's like, I'm ready to go to work and it's like 7 o'clock. She's like, honey, you don't have to be there till 8. It's all right. Just calm down. I'm like, can you tell I love what I do? I'm a morning person. But when it comes to night, I'm like, and Michelle's like, let's party. Let's watch a movie. <laughs> okay, five minutes. You know, we're, we're opposite, aren't we, in a lot of relationships. But somehow, supernaturally, when even though you're opposite, God will put, when you begin admitting your faults, the opposite characteristics tend to go away. And you start to see a lot of compromise and you start to see a lot of, what's the word? I can't think of the word. Um, you're just getting along better. You're, you're putting your opposite down and you're coming together as husband and wife. And the same is true for parent and child relationships, right? How many of you have children that are so way out there, so opposite from you, that it's not even funny? If your child is next to you, don't raise your hand. But you know what I mean. You just simply have to say, hey, son, daughter, I love you no matter what you do. Let me just share with you our conflict that we're going through. I take full responsibility. So we have to start with ourself. We have to do an honest evaluation. And it's okay to say, Lord, I know I have weaknesses. Would you help me? 
to strengthen those weaknesses in my relationship, in my relationships at work, and wherever I go. Amen? And then, anybody in like a log jam right now with a, with a conflict? Let me see. Just be, be honest. Yeah, I'm having a conflict. Okay. I'm about to give you the secret sauce. The special sentence that I know. I don't even remember Justin Wilson. I guarantee. I guarantee you're going to be able to have victory in that conflict. Are you ready? You you might want to write this down because it is so good. Like I said, it's the secret sauce, the special sentence. So remember, we, we, we make the first move, we ask God, we admit our faults. And then right after you admit your fault, you say this. Are you ready? Say, I'm ready. I'm sorry, I was only thinking of myself. After you've picked them off the floor... <laughs> Hey, try that with your coworker that you're with conflict. Maybe try that with your spouse or your child that you're in conflict with. Maybe a sibling. I'm sorry, I was only thinking of myself. And I'm telling you, you're going to start to see some positive movement towards healing and restoration. I put in your notes this little quote. Actually, the Lord gave me this. I didn't look it up. I I thought it was pretty good in good timing. Unresolved conflict is postponed freedom. And sometimes it gets postponed until the next generation. Isn't that good? How many of you would like to encounter freedom now rather than continue the conflict to your children's 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 children? Amen. We have to remember what is the goal of resolving conflict? Do you remember? Oh, I didn't do a good job tonight. Thank you, Jesus. It's peacemaking. That's the goal. We have to know that it's what Jesus wants us to do. He was on the mountain telling these people, hey, if you want to be blessed in your marriages, if you want to be blessed with your neighbors, maybe co-workers at your workplace, people here at church, I forgot about that one. If you want to be blessed, you have to become a peacemaker. You have to strive for peacemaking at all cost. Amen? Otherwise, you're just going to postpone your freedom. I'm going to end with this story, and I say it all the time, and I probably said it about three months ago. I did a funeral last year here in Lafayette where a grandmother passed away. And there was a bitter feud between the two daughters and with their grandmother. I'm sorry, the, 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 um, the two daughters and the mom and also with the grandchildren and the grand, I mean, it was, it was a wreck. And right there in the funeral home was one aisle and I watched it happen. One daughter sat on one side and the other daughter sat on the other side. And when people came in, they had to decide which side that they were going to sit on. That's sad, isn't it? Very sad. My heart broke. And the only eulogy that was offered was a venting from one of the granddaughters. And I had to follow that up with a message as best as I could. But it was literally so sad to see this family torn apart. 
that they picked sides at their mother and grandmother's funeral. And when I was studying this morning for this, I, the Lord reminded me of that story. There was a lot of conflict in that family. Nobody obviously made the first move. Nobody asked God. Nobody admitted faults. And that's where I got this little quote today, postpone freedom. I don't know if that family will ever experience freedom unless God, unless somebody intervenes and helps. And I don't want us to be in that position of generational conflicts going from one to another. I think there are generational conflicts unless they are handled and done the right way, the Jesus way. Amen. So, there will be a quiz next Wednesday night. What's the goal of Dana? You're the man. Thank you, sir. Luke, did you pay attention? Did you note that? $5 for Dana. So, that's, that's a long joke, let me tell you. But anyway, are y'all good tonight? Did y'all, did y'all, are y'all getting something out of this? Well, listen, next week, uh, again, I think I'm going to do seven. I already said I'm doing seven, but I don't have the other four, but we're going to get there because I think seven's a good number. It's the Lord's number. Amen. I can do six or eight, but I think I'm going to stick to seven. So if you would, just stand with me. Oh, by the way, <clears throat> do you know why I do handouts? <clears throat> listen, make copies. Give to your relatives. Let them uh, chew on it. Invite them next week because I'm going to do a very brief recap to do the other points. But listen, the, these notes, don't waste them. Take them home, reread them, look at them, give them to other people. You may not be in conflict right now, but keep them close by so that you can go, where's Rob's handout? He's the handout guy. Because if you're like me, I'm not going to remember these three points. But if I've got something to refer back to, right, it helps. So I just wanted you to be, um, be part of that. So next Wednesday, we'll have another handout and uh, we'll finish it up. But uh, y'all good tonight? Hallelujah. Well, Father, I just pray that right now for just explaining and teaching and giving us insights to know, Lord, how to take this life skill to a new level. And I pray that your peace would flood these people and even online. Lord, begin showing us people that we may have conflict with. Lord, we know that, that your heart for us is just one word, and that is peacemakers, peacemaking. Lord, I pray that even as we go home or even tomorrow or next week or whenever, that, Lord, we're not going to just throw this paper away or discord it or say, uh, that, that's a great bookmark. No, Lord, we're going to take the information and we're going to let it just marinate and just apply in our hearts so that, Lord, we can be healed and the other person be healed. Help us in our work relationships. Help us in our marriages, our siblings, our children, our parents. Lord, do a work in us and through us. I pray that your blessing would be upon us tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen and amen, amen. Well, thanks for coming.